Why did Anthony experience these very pedestrian temptations to return to various pleasures of the world that he had so vigorously surrendered when he committed himself to Christ and to the spiritual journey? And this is our question. Why do we, after having been so generous for a number of years of prayer and in our religious duties, why are we experiencing still these feelings of vanity, apathy, anger, grief, lust, pride, anger, envy, etc.? In other words, why are we feeling emotions which we find out if they're strong enough and painful enough, we do almost anything to get rid of them. And this leads us into personal sin, which is the willingness or activity that tramples on the rights and needs of others or is just indifferent to them and to our own needs in order to satisfy our desires or to get away from something that is painful or perceived as painful. And the answer to that is that the heart of Christian ascesis is the dismantling of the unconscious value system of put together in early life, which we've been calling the emotional programs for happiness, especially when they have been fossilized and developed and defended through the process that winds up with what have been called an energy center. Those of you who are familiar with Hindu uh, philosophy will know right away that these first three energy centers correspond quite closely, if not exactly, with the first three chakras in, in the Kundalini uh, energy. The, the, the chakra that represents graduation from those three lower levels of energy is the heart chakra. And in our diagram, it corresponds to the mental egoic level. That is to say, the beginning of human life in its specifically human capacity to relate to other people, to meet other minds and hearts, instead of trying to manipulate with our reason, with its energy, the lower levels of human consciousness that are uh, developmental rather than fully human. In other words, reason in the service of, of organizing the subhuman levels of, of human energy and consciousness and activity is, is the normal situation we find ourselves in when we uh, first embrace the spiritual journey, or when we first hear the call to repent, change the direction in which you're looking for happiness, or please grow up. <laughs> That's what it means. Now, we've been watching this process occurring in Anthony, whose generosity is certainly beyond question. And even in this remarkable person, and even when he was enjoying uh, one of the most spring-like of spring bring-like experiences of the spiritual life, was feeling exactly the same temptations. Because as long as the roots of these programs are still in our unconscious, then the thoughts are bound to arise. And if they don't arise spontaneously, the demon is represented as helping them to arise by stimulating us with thoughts or feelings in our imagination, etc. Now, we, we saw that, uh, his, uh, that it, Anthony's attractions to leave the spiritual journey once and for all were uh, of two kinds. One was the positive attraction of the memory of the wonderful things in life he had enjoyed. The other was the negative feelings that the demon inspired about the new life that he had taken. How can you stand this shed or this shack day after day? How will you feel 30 years from now? You may die if you stay here. It's all, all this negativity is, is again, uh, the security system our survival security needs expressing themselves once again because they are still 
firmly entrenched in the unconscious. Hence, to simply decide to follow the gospel is not enough, and after the dust settles from the springtime of the spiritual journey, up come the old temptations with the same or more force than forever. Now, this is the spiritual journey. You would think <laughs> that you would be making progress that you could feel, but the spiritual journey is not a career. <laughs> it, it's not a constant growth process that you can feel and appreciate. It's rather, it's characterized by the ever-increasing gift of self-knowledge in which we perceive our mixed motivation and the dark side of our personality. And because we are becoming more humble, are able to sit with it peacefully and to be content to be weak, poor, miserable, etc. Nobody's asking us to be anything else. And, and if we, if our, if our, nothing is more helpful to reduce pride to reasonable proportions than this existential experience of self-knowledge. But if you're discouraged by it, you've misunderstood it. Rather, this is the time when the divine assistance begins in earnest. And, and precisely in response to the generosity in facing this dark side, like Anthony was doing, what happens? What happens when, when you've been struggling with these efforts in, active, uh, in our active daily life to not to act out of those centers or deliberately to dismantle the false self-system or to do use some, some active prayer sentence that helps us to, to maintain a certain continuity with our, our periods of, of contemplative prayer during the day. What happens is that, that that God simply comes closer. And he doesn't have to do anything else. Of course, he's already present. So even to say he comes closer is not quite the right way of saying he's already there. So perhaps it would be better to say he, he turns up the voltage, you might say, of, the, of our interior light. For instance, in this room, which is so well appointed and put together and, and cleaned every day, uh, it looks as though it was pretty good. Uh, we're happy to sit here. Well, suppose we bring in about uh, 50 10,000 watt bulbs and put the floor under, a, under a, mi uh, a magnifying glass. And now the room would start to crawl. and We'd see all the little creatures. Uh, you couldn't stay here anymore. We'd all head for the door. And it would, and, and, uh, and, and it would just be impossible. Well, now. When, when, in response to our generosity, that is to say, sticking to our determination when the springtime is over, God lovingly says to himself, you might, I'm extrapolating, oh boy, this person is really serious about the, the spiritual journey. Let's go to work on him and, 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 and clean out the inside and get him ready for this great future we have for him of union. And so, so he's just delighted. And, and his way of expressing delight is to turn up the voltage. And as an automatic consequence, one's insides begin to crawl, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> and the damage that this stuff is doing to us appears, and, and all our good deeds seem like dirty dish rags. And, and as far as ever hearing about them again, we'll settle if nobody ever brings them up, including <laughs> God at the Last Judgment. Okay. So now this period of uh, is, is, is what St. John of the Cross calls uh, the night of sense. And, and, and he is the one who has distinguished this very difficult period, perhaps more articulately than anybody else in, uh, in the spirit, uh, of spiritual writers. Uh, he is the one who perceived that the, the cause of this dryness or this diminution of satisfaction in our relationship with God and in the concrete in our participation in prayer, liturgy, or ministry is the direct effect of, of, of an increase of, of contemplative prayer, 
that is to say, an increase of pure faith. In other words, the voltage in which faith, which is a gift of God, is beaming into our, into our little church, into our little world here, is increased. But we don't have the receptive apparatus ready to properly interpret that experience. And so it, it, it is experienced as a loss. What was lost? the free and easy friendliness that we had previously enjoyed with God as a result of our relationship, our listening to the Word of God in Scripture, and our participation in, 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 in various activities designed to manifest our, our love or dedication or devotion to God and the service of, of, of those in need. Now, when we pick up the scriptures, it, it's, it's an effort to stay there for the time that we agreed. Before, it might have been very fruitful in, in reflecting on, on the gospel and, and that experience of, of identifying with the various episodes uh, as, as a part of our own experience of, of grace uh, begins to fade. And, and one experiences a certain lack of satisfaction in the spiritual exercises that we might have had before. At the same time, one doesn't have a great deal of satisfaction in other things either. In other words, this, this light of faith, this contemplative prayer that is being beamed into our, our inmost being, produces a kind of lack of satisfaction across the board both in, in the things relating to God and, and in other things that we used to get very excited in and, and, and put a lot of emotional investment into. What this means is uh, that God is, is, is infusing into our minds the basic fact that he alone can fully satisfy. This is a positive experience. It's not a dissatisfaction with anything, pleasure, money, power, anything. It's simply the realization that is taking root once and for all that no created thing is going to bring us full satisfaction. So it, it's the beginning of the existential experience, the emotional experience included, that all the satisfactions we we're seeking before, motivated by the emotional programs for happiness, cannot possibly give us absolute happiness. And we begin to dawn on us that that's really what we wanted. We were trying to milk a cow that has no more milk, that has dried out. And so, and now the, the realization dawns, and it's not through reflection or reasoning, but it's the direct intuition that only God can satisfy. And naturally, this creates a certain period of mourning because all the things we had hoped might bring us to satisfaction are just getting dried out as a result. They're still there, and, and we, we, we do them, but this, the oomph has gone out of them. And, and, and so this is alarming at first because our, our commentaries also were, haven't been purified yet. So there's a feeling that maybe there's something wrong in our relationship to God. And so the second sign that John of the Cross uh, says indicates this period of growth in the interior life take, is manifested by a certain anxiety in our relationship to God. And the a fear that maybe we're moving backwards, or that maybe we committed some fault and, uh, and have gotten on the wrong side of God. Obviously, all human extrapolations or projections onto God of what we would do if somebody treated that, us that way. So, so since there's no affirmation coming uh, from God's side, one can get into quite a stew if one starts getting anxious and following one's anxious thoughts. And, and, and one, some people experience it as the end of their relationship to God. 
What has ended is simply their over-dependence on the senses and reasoning in order in their relationship to God. And God is giving them or offering them something much more intimate, sublime, and beautiful. And if they would just relax and sit still, they would begin to perceive it. Because it's so subtle that uh, if, as long as we're sort of struggling, it's a little like a baby being weaned from the breast. You know, usually such uh, infants don't think that's such a hot idea. So, but if they once learn to do so, then they will be able to receive stronger food and much more nourishing food. It's a part of growing up. And so this is, is a period of weaning, not only from, from the, the uh, mixed motivation and selfishness that had characterized our previous relationships with everybody, including God, but it also is an opening to a new life, a new intimacy, a new relationship with God, which takes time to get used to like new food for the baby. Okay, now the, the third sign that John of the Cross mentions, and he suggests that all three should be together in the discernment, because if only one and not another is present, there could be some pathology, like a depression going. Well, anyway, the third one is an inability, disinclination to, to practice discursive meditation or what we call the reflective part of listening to the Word of God in Scripture. And indeed, the, the spontaneous prayer also becomes uh, dried out and of little interest. So one is, is, finds oneself sitting there without the inclination to meditate discursively. So the mind wanders, and you're aware of more thoughts than ever. And, and, and the will is not inclined to make multiply particular acts, it feels more inclined to, to interior solitude and even to quiet. And, and sometimes people feel this, this very strong attraction without knowing why or where it comes from, just to sit down and to be with God, although you can't touch Him or can't find Him and you feel He's gone away, and yet at the same time there's this mysterious attraction just to be alone with God, even though he seems to be a million miles away. Now, this uh, experience, John of the Cross says, is very common and happens almost to everybody on the spiritual journey, and he says fairly soon, whatever that means. Maybe a few years, maybe less. But uh, you can be sure it's happening if in your struggle with these uh, uh, temptations to return to one's former way of life and to let the spiritual journey be handled by somebody else, if you are sticking to the spiritual journey, you will inevitably come into this place. Because this is the way that God assists or comes to the help of our personal efforts. He moves in. And now we, we find, to our dismay, that our personal efforts don't work anymore. Actually, the one who does the work, or most of it, from, from this point on, is the Spirit of God. And our efforts are often more of a hindrance than a help. At the same time, there must be effort, but again, this whole process is making us more sensitive to allowing God to take the initiative instead of starting off in our highfalutin plans for holiness of one kind or another. For instance, my great plan to become a contemplative by sitting in that church was just blown to smithereens by, by the feelings of jealousy. My great idea to spend time before the Blessed Sacrament was completely ruined by being sick for almost a couple of years and not being anywhere near a place where the Blessed Sacrament was. I spent some, some of that time in a hospital. Well, anyway, uh, this begins to teach us that our bright ideas and our plans and our programs, our preconceived ideas, our prepackaged value system are not so good. And, and, and it gives us, through the faithful practice of contemplative prayer, space in which to change and to allow ourselves to, to be sensitive to following God's lead rather than our bright ideas 
plans, programs, whether we concocted them or whether we received them unquestioningly in our parental or religious education. It's, uh, this much is certain, and it's worth remembering, that all of us are incredibly sunk and trapped in our cultural conditioning. The way we think, the way we talk is, is, is incredibly preconditioned and programmed. If, if, I don't know what the percentage is, maybe if you rose uh, out of your cultural conditioning by maybe 50 or 60 percent, you'd be doing well, I don't know. But even when we have, 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 have the maximum amount of, of freedom, we still are children of time and place and, and the conditioning that our brains have gone through at a time when we were not really fully able to evaluate it. So, so grace, remember, one of the great graces was, was to free ourselves also from over-identification with the values uh, insofar as they were uh, not the values of the gospel, to be free enough to lay them aside and firm enough to, to part with some company, places or things that are a hindrance to our spiritual journey. And so both sides of those of, those, of that process are being furthered in this night of sense, which of course is a poetic term. By night he means unknowing, in a general sense, not only of knowledge in the mind, but also of experience. In other words, our ordinary ways of relating to God, which we knew, are now being changed into ways that we don't know. And this is, is is pulling the rug out from under all our plans and strategies for, for the spiritual journey. We're being taught that the spiritual journey is, is a path that we don't know. And the more you know about it, or think you know about it, <laughs> the less you know. So, so God has to disidentify us from our own ideas in this process of enlightening us from within through the infusion of His grace. So these trials are not coming from God. They're simply coming from us once he turns on the light. He's letting us in on our weakness and deficiencies, not to overwhelm us with woe, but to encourage us to entrust ourselves completely to him. In other words, he's inviting us to step out of the window of our house that is burning down anyway and commit ourselves in, in faith and trust into the hope He'll catch us, and he never misses. Well, anyway, uh, an interesting thing occurs when this night becomes intense. And St. John, again, is our mentor here when he says that three intense trials may arise in the night of sense that make it more difficult <laughs> but also accelerate its progress and, and enable us once and for all to put to, to rest the motivation coming from the subhuman <laughs> vault self system. And these, he, these three temptations, he, he says, occur not to everybody and not all of them to everyone, but appropriately as they are useful. <laughs> Or according to one's temperament and, and background. And, and he said, these are a sign uh, that we really are in the night and that also he's calling us to, to the higher stages of consciousness. Okay? Now there are th these three, uh, are the, of these three, the first one he mentions, he calls the spirit of fornication. Let me read to you what he says about that. The first trial of the night of sense occurs for some souls when, the, when Satan, the spirit of fornication, is given to them in order to buffet their senses with abominable and strong temptations and to afflict them with thoughts and very vivid images of a sexual nature. This is sometimes a worse affliction for them than death. The reason for that is they're expecting that since they're working on their purification that such temptations are gone forever. And, and, and now 
this, this upsurge of temptation arises. Well, let's see how this happened in Anthony. He experienced this one in, in, a, in a way that was extremely prolonged and trying. We are, we are told that, that, uh, that the devil uh, immediately after uh, Anthony had resisted these positive and negative attractions to return to his old life, uh, pulled this trick out of his bag. Anthony, as a result of his fidelity, was now moving into this night, this development of his growth, and he evidently was uh, so fervent that, <laughs> that he experienced rather quickly one of these uh, very intense temptations. And, it, and first of all, it's rather thoroughly described by St. Athanasius, the devil lobbed uh, these uh, vivid uh, thoughts into his imagination, somewhat the way uh, in war you lob these mortars into the city to soften up the population, and then the troops go in and take the town. So the demon was dropping various pornographic images into his imagination, and Anthony was resisting them, as he always did, with his prayer and his determination and, and his trust in God. Well, the next salvo involved feelings of, uh, of uh, sexual nature in his body. And, uh, and again, Anthony was struggling with that. And then occasionally came fantasies, or like ghosts, uh, one of which uh, some, uh, the devil impersonated a, a, a beautiful and seductive lady, and, and uh, entered his room and, and tried to stir up his, his interest in, in, in such, uh, with such uh, enticements. This, this is a part of his temptation that has always intrigued artists, for what reason I know not. <laughs> in any case, <laughs> this is what has made Anthony famous and all the other really important things he did. He was subject to this, uh, this mysterious ghostly seduction. Well, anyway, he resisted that, too. Well, now, the, the text says that the struggle between Anthony and the demon was so strong that even his friends observed the battle that was going on. Well, now, most of the time, we don't know when people are going through this kind of intense temptation, unless we're the object of it, of course. And so here, here Anthony was, was kind of being oppressed or obsessed day and night with these kinds of thoughts and with uh, apparently it went on for a long time maybe days or months so here's the poor guy losing sleep he can't relax his nervous system is tense he's done all he could to resist it nothing works they keep coming back and so so he, he must feel like someone you know sitting under niagara falls all these thoughts are just being doused on top of him and and, and his prayers are kind of pathetic a little like a buoy that is kind of lost in the storm and buried under the waves. So, so when, when and temptations of this kind, which are very vivid, go on for a long time, then the conscience begins to get uncertain whether it's consenting to them or not, because it thinks, well, if I was rejecting them, they wouldn't come back. But that's not true. In the time of temptation, they keep coming back, back, back. And, 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 and the, there's no question except that, that, that this is one way in which the full force of the sexual energy becomes obvious. Uh, incidentally, uh, since Anthony was going to be the f parent of many in the spiritual order, obviously he, he needed the sexual energy. Remember, he'd led a very withdrawn life in early childhood, so probably he was not aware of the force of that energy. And as it was beginning to rise up on its way to spiritual transformation, he experienced it in, in, with, with a special force because he, he, he needed to confront it and to know what it was, which is quite different from consenting to sexual misconduct. But now after some days, weeks, perhaps months of, of constant struggling with, his, with these uh, physical and imaginary uh, temptations of the sexual nature, we come to, the, to the, de the, the demon's last resort, which is really 
uh, again, uh, a malicious. Here's this demon kicks you when you're down, so to speak. That's his specialty. And so he comes up with the suggestion, well, now, Antony, you've done your best, and it's not working. You might as well, why don't you just give in? That was his suggestion. Well, here, Anthony responds with anger and grief. Now, this, this is the certain sign he wasn't consenting, because if uh, grief, remember, is the emotion that registers our value system when we're experiencing an evil as present. So the fact that he experienced grief was the certain sign, and anger, which was the which is uh, the experience of a, of a difficult evil that has descended upon one, was the sign that he, he, his will hadn't consented because he experienced them as evils. Okay, So now he, he, he does an interesting thing. He introduces into his memory the re recollection of the fires of hell. Now, again, this is not to stir up fear, because fear would be counterproductive, in, in a, especially in temptations uh, of a sexual character. Fear, remember, uh, uh, prepares you to fight or to flee. The body responds to that by pouring certain chemicals into the bloodstream so that you're ready to move. <laughs> And, 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 and thus, it would have stirred up and made the temptation even worse. So, so notice the strategy. Here he is uh, 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 having these temptations which were as serious as burning oil, according to the text. And on the other hand, he introduces another fire. So what he was doing was thinking of, of material fire that was painful on the same level as as the, the in, uh, enticements which were like a flame of pleasure. So by putting the memory of pain into his imagination, he lit another fire. And as, in, as is the strategy in forest fires, he was able to put out one fire by lighting another. He put out the fire of, of passion by thinking of the fire of pain. And, and so he wasn't afraid to make use of whatever strategy he could to, to, in his last stand, to maintain his commitment to, this, to using all his energies in the spiritual journey. In his case, he had made this celibate commit, commitment with a view of, of, of uh, training that energy and using it in the pursuit of the spiritual journey. Of course, the spiritual journey goes on in, in, in other states of life, too. But uh, at some point, the, the attitude towards the sexual energy also needs purification in the sense that its exercise needs the freedom from compulsion, which is the touchstone of, of, of human freedom. Well, anyway, uh, and poor Anthony <laughs> finally came through unscathed. And, uh, and then, immediately, the demon changes his character and starts fawning on him, saying, you're not like the rest of the people who are easy prey for these temptations. You're really somebody. And so he starts, notice, to, to persuade Anthony to take credit for this victory, which only came through the help of Christ. Of course, Anthony's response to that is, to hell with you. That is... <laughs> <laughs> he would not fall victim to the tendency to pride. And so, actually, the worst temptation in temptations of, of, uh, of the sexual energy appetite is, is to take credit for emerging from the situation unscathed. And it's only then that Athanasius says this was Anthony's first victory over Satan. Not I, but the grace of God in me is the, is the verse that he quotes as the s sign of, what, uh, of who had given him the victory. So to, to extrapolate now, uh, we don't hear Anthony going through the other two temptations that John of the Cross says are characteristic 
of this period of the spiritual journey, which he calls the night of sense. That is to say, that period in which the senses are, are, are permanently quieted in their tendency to exaggeration and become integrated finally, together with the sexual energy, into the ongoing advancement of human values in the higher levels of human integration and on into higher states of consciousness. <coughs> 